Hi everyone, welcome back. It's Professor Hall, and today we are looking at proto science fiction. So fiction um, written before sci-fi became its own genre. Um, we're going to look in this lecture at Lucian's uh, true history, and then in the next lecture we're going to look at Margaret Cavendish's new blazing world, and then we will examine Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Um, sometimes that is considered the first scientific Sorry, the first science fiction work. And sometimes it's put into this category of proto science fiction. So that's something that we'll be talking about. But at any rate, what is proto science fiction? Well, proto is a prefix from the Greek word for first. It means original, first, precursor, or forerunner. For example, a prototype would be the first model of something that would be copied or improved upon or developed later on. So you can think of like Windows 1.0, that would be the prototype. Um, after that came Windows 2.0, Windows 3.6, Windows 10, um, etc. So like prototypes, Proto science fiction works were like a first model. They were written before sci fi became its own genre. They often blended fantasy, mythology, speculative fiction, adventure. And I don't have this in here, but very often utopian works and um, some satire are put into this category as well. And those are some things that we're going to be talking about with these two proto science fiction works. Um, they inspired later fantasy books and early science fiction novels. So Frankenstein, which, as I said, we'll also discuss, which was written in 1818, and then The Time Machine, which was published in 1895. Many people think of H.G. Wells as kind of um, being the grandfather of science fiction and, and really his books setting off sci-fi as its own thing. But I think that if you look at Frankenstein, um, there are many other authors, including some who are not writing in English, like Jules Verne, who really have these science fiction works. Um, H.G. Wells certainly had some seminal works, and we're going to look at his book, War of the Worlds, later on. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit de of debate as to when science fiction actually started, but I think it's interesting to see proto-science fiction and, and how it influenced authors later on. Satire is often a feature of these books, and it certainly is for the first one that we're going to be looking at. Satire is a genre of literature in which writers use irony and exaggeration, let me get out my pen, to ridicule or criticize or hold up different institutions, individuals, the government, or society as a whole. Now, we sort of... Um, think of satire as being funny, but it isn't always necessarily funny. It's just using irony and exaggeration. Satire sometimes shows disapproval for conduct, for conduct and calls for people to do better and turn away from their vices or follies. So this little um, cartoon, we want our girls to grow up believing they really can be anything they want to be, so long as they're slim. So using a, a time, is it funny? I don't, I mean, I laughed because I find it humorous, but other people might be like, yeah, you know what? That's kind of true. Um, women can be anything as long as they're attractive and they're thin, right? It's calling for people to do better. Some, as I said, sometimes it's humorous, but not always. Often the humor is really more apparent to the people living in that time and, and place. So this is a, a depiction of SNL in the 70s, making fun of Jimmy Carter. If you watch this today, unless you're a real history buff who understood what was going on with the Carter administration, it really is not that funny. There's a little bit of physical comedy that might make you laugh, but, but for the most part, like what they're talking about isn't funny to us today. So this is one of the reasons that I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background um, into the, the, the excerpts that we're looking at from Lucian and from Margaret Cavendish, because there's a little bit of satire that we might not pick up on because we're not living among those institutions being criticized. And we're not really part um, of that society that is, that, that, these authors are trying to criticize or um, particularly certain individuals that they are satirizing.
So who is Lucian of Samosata? Um, a, a word that I keep mispronouncing. <laughs> if you've looked at other things, I might have called it Samosa or Samosata. Uh, I, keep, I keep mispronouncing it. But here's a depiction of Lucian. He lived around 120 to 180 AD, sometimes called BCE. B, um, I'm sorry. CE, which stands for Common Era. Um, AD means Anno Domini. So just after, um, just after um, the life of Jesus Christ, which is a lot of times how we split things. So if you see things as B BC or BCE, um, now we look at BCE as before Common Era, just to kind of explain that. But at any rate, um, he was a Syrian by birth and um, wrote satirical works in. Greek. There's not too much known of his early life, especially because he was a satirist and a humorist and nearly everything he wrote, even about himself, is filled with sarcasm. But he was apprenticed as a sculptor, um, it seems, left home to acquire a Greek education, became familiar with the works of Homer and Plato, which we see a little bit of in this, um, in this work that we're going to be looking at, these epic Greek writers, but also of the comic poets and and certainly to um, comic authors of, of plays such as Aristophanes. He began a career as a public speaker. So they, they had these rhetoricians that would go around and, and give philosophical speeches and, and hold debates and things like that. But he became tired of wand this kind of wandering life. And he wrote satirical and critical essays, um, criticizing human behavior, beliefs in the supernatural, religious practices, and inability to understand the transience of wealth and status. There's, um, I talk about this in the next lecture as well when I get into the analysis of Lucian's work. Um, there's a little bit of discrepancy and, and debate over how, to what extent people believed Greek myths. Um, if you look at Greek life and Greek mythology, it takes place over a long period of time. So um, did people at the time really believe in these things or were they more Hellenism, which is um, an aspect of Greek culture? That's really something for you to decide. He's also known today for some of his satirical comments about the early Christian church, where he kind of gently makes fun of um, early Christians and says that they were very gullible and allowed people to take advantage of them. So it's interesting that some of his work has survived because it's of interest to um, religious scholars or it became of interest to religious scholars in looking at... Um, at history from this perspective. So this is a depiction of the hero's journey. This is something that um, I'm going to provide for you if you're in my class. A couple different pictures just so you can see different depictions of this. This came out of the work of Joseph Campbell who looked at what he called the monomyth, meaning that a lot of stories, mythologies have this um, journey of a hero where we have a call to adventure. A lot of times at that call, the hero is reluctant. Um, then they meet a mentor who helps them in some way or encourages them to cross this threshold into a different world or into adventure. They go through trials, they have failures through those trials, they grow new skills. Um, the death and rebirth has sometimes also been called, this is a term I'm going to use in other lectures, if I can write with my mouse pad and not look like a, a, a five-year-old. Um, sometimes this is called the the abyss. It's not necessarily a death and rebirth, but maybe just the lowest point that the that the character goes through. At some point, they have a revelation. They come out of that low point with a, a real final change in their character development. Um, somehow, there's an atonement where they make up for that. They they conquer or they um, fulfill their quest, and sometimes they get a gift or um, a sometimes that gift might might be another form of magic. Sometimes it might be nothing more than um, insight or um, 
coming of age or personality change. And then they return somehow changed. Now, sometimes they return back to the normal world and sometimes they um, become a, a, a king or a queen or a ruler of the world that they're in. So um, this is a little bit, if you think about the typical, again, <laughs> let me try one more time. There we go. Our typical plot arc, we have um, narrative exposition, we have uh, inciting events, um, rising action, the climax, and sometimes the falling action, and then the resolution. This isn't really too... This isn't really too much different. This is just a kind of a way to understand, um, rather than just the plot, the actual character arc. So it's it's a tool that I'm going to be using to kind of explain uh, as I summarize each piece. We'll look at the hero's journey and how that plays a role in some of these books, because many science fiction writers have used this as almost a template for their stories. And there's still ink on the slide. Okay, there we go. So the call to adventure in this story, the edge of the world. Now, I don't know how well this is coming out. This was like either an ink print or possibly a wood print. But we have these women who are um, grapevine, uh, grapevines on certain parts of them but they're like anthropomorphized grapevines it's quite interesting um so a true history sometimes also called a true story it starts with a warning to the reader it's our narrative exposition uh, the events are completely untrue and impossible the reason that he calls this a true history is part of the satire that i'll get into more later when i uh analyze the book but basically Lucian gives this warning to the reader, hey, this is all made up. Um, other writers at the time were blending mythology with history, and he did not care for that. So the actual story starts with this voyage. Um, they, they start out at sea at the Pillars of Heracles, which is this strait that connects the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea, um, separates Europe from Africa. The boat takes, uh, goes on this journey, and they basically come to the edge of the world. They find a note saying that Heracles, also known as Hercules, and Dionysus, who's the god of wine, also known as Bacchus, um, reached this point. This refers to a historian that Lucian is criticizing for giving an impossible history, which actually could not have occurred. But this point seems to be the edge of the world. And they have this encounter with these women here that are part grapevines and part seductresses. And then the um, this de description of a river of wine um, and these creatures that are combining seductive women with grapevines. The grapevine women try to mate with the men and the crew. And some of them um, fall to this and they, they um, start to grow grapes on their nether regions. And then the crew escapes and the ship is borne aloft on the wind. I love this picture here kind of showing what this would look like. It's like a, a, an event out at sea, almost like a hurricane that brings the ship up into the air. And the sails carry the ship and we have a voyage into the skies. So that's really crossing this threshold of the normal world and this fantastical world. When the ship goes to outer space, they encounter various alien races. Now, um, the translation I have for you is using different words. And I, I specifically picked this translation because it was easier to read. So they'll say like horse vultures. But initially he, he uses these words like hippo jibby, which are combining the um, hippo, which is horse and jip, which is vulture. But there are um, these aliens who are basically mixtures of mythological creatures up in space. And then we have our trials and failures, which is our space odyssey. Um, and here you can see different parts of the battle as these various creatures fight one another. So they come to the moon and they meet Endymion. 
In Greek mythology, Endymion is a shepherd or possibly a king who was disguised as a shepherd. And in different myths, these were oral traditions. So it's not entirely clear. But he fell in love with Selene, the titan goddess of the moon. And essentially, he can't be with her. And so he asks Zeus, the the Greek god of the heavens and the earth, to put him into an eternal sleep. Here, what's very interesting is that Lucian is not just in keeping with the the typical mythological story. He's changing it for the purposes of fiction, which would really have been um, quite unusual at the time. And he describes Endymion falls asleep. He's magically carried to the moon, possibly by this goddess, and he becomes their ruler. He then attempts to colonize the planet Venus. Now, in your translation, it's going to be called Lucifer, which is also the morning star, because um, that it, it's a little bit of a, a mistranslation, in my opinion. But essentially, Endymion uh, needs to expand... Um, they're having some issues on the moon, so they're going to colonize Venus. Phaethon, the king or the god of the sun, um, again, we're using mythology for our purposes and kind of twisting those myths and just kind of using them as inspiration. Quite interesting for the time. This colonization attempt angers Phaethon, the, the god of the sun. So the 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 people of the moon and the people of the sun go into battle the crew finds themselves in the midst of this war between these extraterrestrials and here we have i don't love these pictures because i think that they don't capture the um the satire of the piece i also don't know why these are depicted as women because really this is all male battle going on but here are some spiders that they have um the the satire here there are people who are like um riding acorns that can fly there are people who are fighting with shields made out of like vegetables things like that um again i'll talk more about this when in, in the analysis but Essentially, there's this crazy battle that really is meant to be funny, but it, um, the, the, the moon is far outmatched by the sun, is what it comes down to. And so they have this kind of a peace treaty, and the people of the moon basically go back to life on the moon as before. So after witnessing this battle and kind of being pulled into it, the ship's crew, um, look at the social structures and the culture and they talk to the men who live on the moon. This is an all-male society. We have possibly a, a little bit of satirization of the, um, uh, the, the Greek traditions of pedestry. The Greeks really, again, I'll go into this more in depth next time, but the Greeks really have quite a different understanding of sexual relations. And the idea of um, pedestry and homosexuality and um, what it means to be straight or gay or bi, they don't have quite the same understanding that we kind of, as we kind of look at things today. Although I will say that I think there are some groups that are kind of um, looking back at that and, and, and questioning, you know, the binary um, and gender norms and things of that nature. But really, that is what's going on in this in this work as well. A um, couple thousand years ago. And whether he is in favor of looking at sex in this way and gender norms or whether he's satirizing um the the pedestry um traditions or whether he's satirizing the um the gender norms that are kind of changing it's not really entirely clear again because we're not living in that society so that's something i really like you to look for but what's interesting to me about this book or this story, is really that we have a, a mixture of a mythology, a mixture of science fiction elements, 
a jumping off point where mythology is not just recanted in a different way or written down in a different way, but really used just as inspiration. And then the fact, too, that we are looking at um, futuristic possibilities. What would it be like if we traveled into outer space? But also, how would that affect social structures? So uh, again, the, the two primary themes of this course, what is the science? and how does that affect the society. So the excerpt that I'm giving you does end at that point after they've they've talked to um, Edidmion and the people of the moon about what their society looks like. After that, the men travel back to Earth. They endure being swallowed by a great whale. They meet a variety of so-called fish people, kind of like talking fish. They enter a sea of milk in an island of cheese. Again, the satirical elements and eventually they come to an island of the blessed, which is kind of like heaven and hell. This is, again, not in your excerpt, but if you wanted to know the end of the story. They meet the heroes from the Trojan War. They see sinners who are being punished, particularly those who wrote supposedly true books that are actually filled with fantasies and lies and mythologies. And then they leave. They discover another continent and the story ends. Um, with a promise that there will be future adventures and sequels, which are never written, and which many critics say are the biggest lie of all, because um, it really sets us up for um, some more adventure. And as far as we know, they were never written, right? They may have been lost to history. So um, yeah, a short excerpt that, that says quite a bit about um, life at that time. And, and I think it's kind of interesting to see this proto science fiction, one of the first science fiction works. Um, coming up, we're going to look at a blazing world by Margaret Cavendish, um, a Renaissance work, as I mentioned, published in 1666. And then we'll also talk about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the book that some consider the first science fiction novel. So we'll look at some of these same kind of um, themes and ideas and trace the development of sci-fi. Thanks, everybody.